Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are continuing our discussion of the Ten Commandments um, using the lens of Thomas Sowell's book, A Conflict of Visions. Uh, last week, we talked about the unconstrained vision and some of the problems with that. And I'm looking now at a little T graph in the back of the book that I made when I was assigned to read this book in college. And I'm looking down the list of people who supported the constrained vision, which we're talking about today. And it's Adam Smith, Alexander Hamilton, Milton Friedman, Hayek, Madison, Jay. And it's kind of like the heroes, you know, (laughs) if you've had a good American education, it can be easy to default to those guys as the rule by which we measure ideas. It's like, well, the American founders said this, but that's not always what we should be doing. And I think we're going to kind of dig underneath that today and talk about why these ideas work or don't work and what's the reasoning underneath them. What's the authority that they're appealing to? In this connection, oddly enough, I want to lay before you Two quotes. One is from Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who's a hero of mine. Uh, In his book, The Death Death in the City, he says this. He's talking about a Christian trying to communicate with a non-Christian, a theist with a materialist. He says, it's as if you had taken an orange, sliced it in half, and only concerned yourself with one of the halves. In other words, Christians see the whole picture. Secularists only have half of it, what they need is the other half. They need to be able to see God, see scripture, see God's providence and all of that. And so they're they're in, they're wrong in that they're incomplete, but they're not exactly wrong. They're right as far as they go. The second quote is from Cornelius Van Til. It's just a throwaway in a forward to another man's book for a time such as this. And he's referring back to Schaefer and he says, obviously he should have said, you have a spoiled orange while I have a fresh <laughs> orange. As we come to the worldview that many of us were, if not actually raised in, at least certainly exposed to, that of conservative American thinking, as Christians, we have to step back and say, we have a full revelation of God in Christ in Scripture. This is truth. It is organic truth. It is unified truth. It's not a truth. It's not a part of the truth that we can plug into your system of thought or that into which you can plug your system of thought. It is total truth. See, Nancy Piercy's book called that. And it must speak to everything because the God it reveals is a transcendent and imminent God who is sovereign over all reality and who manifests himself in everything and manifests himself authority in everything and over everything. So the fact that the conservative worldview often looks Christian, sounds Christian, quacks like a Christian on occasion, (laughs) doesn't mean that it's Christian. It just means that it's a lot closer in outward things to sanity, truth, reason, and reality than is the unrestrained vision, because they've been deliberately copying Christianity for a long time. And And in some cases, speaking out of it. Um, and in some cases, speaking some of out of it, are sincere Christians. They are sincere Christians, but they, and, and some of them are actually, a few of them are actually speaking a Christian world and life view, mm-hmm. but they aren't always so clear on that to the point that other people say, wait, you just challenged my presuppositions and I'm not sure I agree with you. <laughs> right. It's certainly more of a, yeah, and he says so too. Mm-hmm. And, and then there are those who, their thoughts are a mixture of, of conservatism and Christianity and they lack the discernment to say, well, okay, I said we're going to be talking about each of the commandments in turn, but just to pick one, thou shalt not kill. As a conservative and as a Christian, I say thou shalt not kill. Yeah, but do you understand that those are not the same thing and that you're saying thou shalt not kill for two different and ultimately non-reconcilable reasons? It's just convenient for you that both of your, your, your background in one area and your background in the other coincide here because of the strong Christian influence within conservative thinking. Mm -hmm. So this would probably be a good time to to define conservatism or the constrained vision, which uh, comes down to this. Human nature is constrained. One, it's finite. It's man's never going to know everything. He's never going to have enough information. He's always going to be asking what, why, and how. 
And furthermore, he's constrained morally in that he does bad things. He makes selfish choices. In fact, by and large, he is governed by a desire to take care of himself, to look out after number one. And this has implications both for government and economics. Now, because Christianity also says very similar things about man, at least on the superficial level, it's easy to see how there could be some agreement here, at, again, as to superficial things. The uh, constrained vision will say, for instance, in politics, man's not to be trusted. Mm -hmm. So we want to construct a government that uses this, we don't trust men in a profitable way. We're not going to pretend that this doesn't exist. It does, obviously. So we're going to do the division of power thing. We're going to we're going to break up the branches of government, the executive, legislative, judicial. We're going to arm each one with some kind of means of keeping the others out of its business. We're going to break government into federal and state and county. We're going to have all of these ways of trying to pit human ambition against human ambition. And then we're going to slow it down by constitutional processes so that even when people come up with these really great, stupid ideas, the moral ideas, they'll be so slow in the process that they'll run out of steam and it won't happen, we hope, all the time realizing that there's no guarantees no matter what we do. And and to a certain degree, Christians can say, yeah, yeah, that, that, that that's real, that's good. The, the problem is you don't really understand the nature of that self-centeredness because your reference point is man and not God, and that's going mm -hmm. to come out eventually. So... While conservatives are good at conserving, holding on to yesterday's values, and they are very fond of the wisdom and tradition of the past, they conclude that humanity as a whole knows more than even the brightest genius who was born 20 years ago, they still lack an absolute appeal. And as you read through Saul, and I, I, first time I read the book, I was surprised when I hit the passage where Saul basically says, and of course, in the long run, private property is limited by the fact that society comes first. <laughs> what, what? For whom? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> and yet you appeal back to say John Locke. John Locke is a majoritarian for sure. You know, the moment you consent to this, uh, this um, social compact, you're giving up your rights. It, it, it is that simple. You are giving your, up your rights to the whole in the belief that that's a safer protection for your own private rights than trying to fight them out for yourself. But it is the reality of the system, and it is about majority vote and majority needs in the long run. So there really shouldn't be a great surprise here. Mm -hmm. But again, we're so used to mixing Christian and non-Christian themes here that sometimes we forget. And of course, Locke did a great deal to simply borrow from his Puritan heritage. <laughs> right. And, uh, Rutherford. And, yeah, Rutherford, Lex Rex, and, and, and represent it without an explicit appeal to God. I mean, God's in the picture, but he doesn't do much. So that's that's where we are here. We're, we're coming and we're going to talk again about the Ten Commandments. And we're going to see that, that the conservative or the constrained vision has a lot more respect superficially, outwardly, for the Ten Commandments than does the unconstrained vision. The, the conservancy of um, uh, the early British Empire, the early American Republic, does look more Christian, does look more sensible than does say the French Revolution, let, let alone the Bolshevik Revolution in, in Russia. And yet, good enough isn't good enough, maybe for running a country, maybe for making people happy, but for pleasing God, close enough isn't close enough. Yeah, yeah, God, we kind of did it your way. We kind of did it your way. No, it's that's not it. We do it God's way or we don't. There's another king, one Jesus. And, and that's, of course, is where the Ten Commandments start. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, the, I, I'm going to say conservative more than I probably say constrained vision. And, and my background is conservative all over the place. And I was not raised particularly to think of the world other than conservatives and liberals. It was my ongoing Christian training and, and growth in Christ and understanding of his word that made things clear to me. It took a while. The problem we encountered when talking about libertarianism of shorthand labels that mean one thing in one context right. that might be inappropriate in another context definitely applies to conservatism as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm in, in saying these things. I'm shooting at people I grew up knowing, respecting, honoring, following, believing to a certain extent, and many, and as you said, Emily, many of these people still are in a sense my heroes, but. 
I, I, I know the flaws. I know where the, the weak spots are. And so conservatives, and uh, we used to have one of these things on the back of our car, forgotten country, bumper sticker. And of course, the question is, which God? And this seems to be the weakness of the conservative viewpoint. Yes, God. Well, which God? Well, the, you know, the, the God, the, the God we all know, the God that, you know, the God, God, him. They, there may be some mention of the Bible, maybe. There may be some mention of Christianity, the, Christ, the Judeo-Christian God. Wait, <laughs> that, that doesn't work. There is no Judeo-Christian God. The, the God who made the world. Uh, our Heavenly Father. Okay, that's a nice Mormon expression taken out of context. Their conservatives are very slow to name the name of Jesus, very slow to speak about the triune God of Scripture, very slow even to point to Scripture, except in the vaguest ways. Everyone should read the Bible, the morality of the Bible, but they don't open it and read it out loud on uh, over the airwaves or whatever the equivalent now is with uh, the Internet. Uh, there, there's a God yet to be named, a God who we assume is all our God. You know, this sounds remarkably like Freemasonry. You know, yeah. we all believe in one God, right, who made the world, not necessarily created, we have to allow for theistic evolution, and who, who tells us things that uh, gives us a basic morality that we all agree on. Well, see, that's kind of what we're talking about. Do we really all agree on the same morality? If we're not sure we all believe in the same God, the um, American Constitution does call for an oath of office. But at about the same time, it says, and no religious test shall ever be given to any official within the federal government. So you're to swear an oath in the name of someone, because oaths are sworn to a deity. But no one is ever allowed to ask you which deity or to define creedily who he might be or what he might be like. So as long as you, in the privacy of your heart, can affirm that you are calling something bigger than yourself to witness, we got to be all right with that. And we're not allowed to pry any further. Constitutionally, any discussion of what God may say to office holders under the federal constitution is eliminated. You know, we often point at the First Amendment as being kind of tricksy, but this is a far more deeper problem. Who Who is this God? And why should we believe you when you swear in his name, especially if from our point of view, he's mythical? Uh, if someone were to get up and swear by the name of Zeus, I don't think we'd be impressed. What if someone swears by the name of Allah? Are we going to be happy with that? Well, we're supposed to be, because we're not supposed. This is a pluralistic society, is the plea. And we have to be content with all gods. Freemasons are. Years and years ago, I remember uh, sitting in, outside of a martial arts class and finding out that one of the people in my class, that their family were all Scientologists, mm. which was is already a crazy, just new information to drop on anyone. Um, <laughs> but, oh, by uh, the way. <laughs> by the way, Tom Cruise, yeah, we think he's right. Um, <laughs> And one of the things that they that I said is like you know I I wouldn't be interested in that because I'm I'm a Christian I I believe in in Yahweh and the God of the Scriptures revealed to us and in Jesus his his only Son and they were like oh that's fine you can do that too <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but not at the same time <laughs> I know <laughs> so it was kind of like. I, I feel like you don't know that I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel that you were feeling correctly at the point. Because modern Americans are so used to, it's a private matter. In other words, reality is a private matter. We're not really talking about whether or not God is real. We're talking about what you believe in. And there is no reality beyond, behind that that's ever a touchstone that any of us can reach. Uh, it's just the reality is the traffic report and the drive to work and the rotten customers I have at business and my paycheck and my wife burning the bacon. You know, that that's reality. But the stuff about a God, those are nice thoughts. And if they make you a nicer person, okay. 
Once upon a time, a young lady in my uh, theology class, uh, she'd been dis concerned over some of the things I'd been saying. And, and she was she was from a Pentecostal church. And I was saying some things about objective truth and, and spirituality that weren't, weren't going over so well. But she was she was a nice, polite young lady. And she came and said, Mr. Edinger, does it really matter what we believe? Kind of like that. <laughs> and I said, Lisa, what if I told you two plus two is five? And she said, oh, that's different. That's true. <laughs> oh, I see. For the moment, at least, she saw. I don't know how long it stuck with her. But there are a lot of people who do not understand that this first commandment, we're talking about concrete reality, and it absolutely affects everything. It's uh, as real as the burnt bacon. <laughs> as real as the burnt bacon. The second commandment <coughs> says no graven images. And, and generally, can, conservatives are okay with that. If only because they don't want to talk too closely about who God is or cast God in stone, as it were. Uh, and, and too much religiosity disturbs them. They, they seem to be okay with manger scenes at Christmas time, which, by the way, traditional Calvinists actually have a problem with, but that's something else. <laughs> um, but the, the images that they appeal to tend to be things like the Statue of Liberty or pictures of Washington. Well, there's you a know. whole series of political iconography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, la two years ago, I went to D.C. and We got the uh -huh. tour of the White House and the Senate, I think the Senate building as well. And in one of those, I forget which because I don't remember, um, <laughs> is a painting on – it must be in the Senate building because it's on the big domed roof. Uh -huh. Is the painting The Apotheosis of George Washington. Yeah. <laughs> and it's freaking – creepy it's as because creepy as heck yeah at, just the name you know what it's about but okay would for, you, you know there was a time about 10 years ago when i did not know what that word meant would you explain that for anyone listening yes of course um from the last time i googled it i'm running off memory uh, <laughs> apotheosis is the um attainment of a mortal unto the status of deity in yes. greek religion and, and and myth so there's a there's a whole painting dedicated to the idea that George Washington has ascended to some sort of greater than man status or godhood. Right. This is <laughs> yeah, not that's great. That's pretty scary actually. Yeah. I did not know that. I did not know that was there. That's that's a thing. And I it cheapens deity as well. I mean like not only would it be creepy to believe that George Washington had actually attained some sort of you know higher plane but then to to say, oh, it's okay because we don't actually believe that. It's like, well, then why did you paint the picture? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Why, why did taxpayer funds go to this particular project? Yeah. That's a little odd. Mm -hmm. Do you know when it was done? What year? It was, it's the it, early 19th yeah. century. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> all right. Well, that's about the right time for those things. All right. Well, let's just leave that. Yeah. A real kind of patriotic iconography for sure oh it was actually uh painted in 1865 <laughs> less surprise <laughs> less yeah this the is beginning to make a lot more sense yeah <laughs> yeah we we need this is the point where we needed divine heroes superheroes to pull the nation back together again we point back to the man who's the undisputed founder, favorite president favorite yeah, yeah favorite president <laughs> the man beyond reproach um yeah. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. I, I would imagine that if people did roll over in their graves, <laughs> he might be he might have responded that way. Mm. Third commandment, we are to honor God's name. The obvious social application is to oaths. Swear an oath is to call upon God as the searcher of men's hearts to rid of judgment and to punish those who swear falsely. But we've already talked about this a little bit. The, um, the Constitution requires an oath. It just tells us not to ask who we're swearing to. Mm -hmm. Traditionally in courts, we raise our right hand to heaven, we even put our left hand on the Bible, and say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And no doubt most people in America for the last couple hundred years have assumed that that God's the God of the Bible. 
But there were probably a great many who did not, who assumed it was their own private version of God, however they conceived of him. And again, we're within the American system, we're not allowed to ask. And so again, this, this perspective is comfortable with a vague God. And there's no place uh, in any of our traditions that say, and you shall swear in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's just right out. And it, just try fitting that into the mouth of any of our presidents or federal office holders or anybody, and it just sounds wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not what we're used to. It's not American mm -hmm. to, to speak in Jesus' name. God, to speak as God, the Lord of hosts, even if you're Abraham Lincoln, you can get away with that one. The Father of Lights, that's, you know, that has its Masonic appeal, its universalist appeal. So O's are good. They, they contribute to social stability. So conservatives are, are good about that. But you, you can't specify which God. And I've mentioned Freemasonry a number of times. This would be a great time, and I'm not going to do it, <laughs> to plunge into the role that Freemasonry did play in the, in the minds and lives of um, framers of the Constitution and the mm -hmm. founders. I, I am not one who believes that the whole creation of the American system was some kind of Masonic conspiracy. <laughs> I am one who believes that a lot of Trinitarian Christians went to Trinitarian church services on Sunday and on weekdays went to free Masonic lodges where they acknowledged a God they couldn't talk about, but who nonetheless approved of them doing good in the name of no one in particular. Mm. And it's one step from there to, all right, well, let's create a nation. That's doing good. Let's create a nation in the name of no one in particular, except some vague God who we will never bring to the front because that's divisive. The one is the microcosm of the other. I don't know that there was any intentional conspiring. I've read books that say there was. You don't need that, though. You just, right. you just need a mindset that says, I can swear to do good in the name of a God that we will not particularly define, and you can too, and you can too. And now that we've all sworn to this, we're all certain and sure that we are absolutely committed to doing this good thing, but now we can never consult anybody's God as to what good is. We all assume that we all agree on what good is. And as long as you come out of the same cultural heritage, it works for a while, <laughs> but not for very long, as our own history testifies, right? Uh, this is not necessarily related to this, but I wanted to kind of just tack it onto the end of the, the second commandment coverage yeah. that we talked about. Um, so this series of political iconography, in addition to this weird deification of state heroes mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the civil war, especially, we also get this personification and near deification of other imagery, such as our national flag. Mm -hmm. The flag code refers to it as if it is a, like to treat it as if it is a living thing, yeah. this flag. And then the oath itself, of course, it's, it, you're not pledging allegiance to th the country. It's to the flag of the mm -hmm. country, which is a little creepy as well. And yeah. then we've, we've, we've all seen people's reactions on Facebook, most likely to news of flags being desecrated in some way and it it's it's visceral yeah. the uh the hatred that people have towards that action it's which is not normal either <laughs> but then there's the hatred of the people have toward the flag right. that too see it's it's so deeply imbued that, that from both directions <clears throat> we've learned to treat the flag as a sacred object in one case, a sacred object that has now been so defiled, the only thing that's fit it's fit for is to burn. And others who know right or wrong, it's a sacred emblem and should never, it's a piece of cloth. Well, doesn't it mean something? Yes, but <laughs> there's nothing in the constitution that defines exactly what it means. Uh, and it's, it's we need to be careful here. I, the, the whole Pledge of Allegiance thing, <laughs> is a different issue, yeah. <laughs> but not too far from where we are. Mm -hmm. And I know there, there are many wonderful, godly people who, who whose hearts swell at the, the Pledge of Allegiance and will national have, anthem, the national anthem, things like this. I have more trouble with the uh, with the pledge than with the national anthem because, uh, well, for a couple reasons. First of all, it was created by a uh, self conscious socialist, 
and the original salute was pretty much the the salute that Hitler the Hitler youth were taught to do. You know, the hand over the heart and stretched out like a Heil Hitler. You can still see pictures of it, but uh, I, I, I have problems with one indivisible. Only God's indivisible. That is a an, an incommunicable attribute of God, and it is a slap in the face at the South for whatever that's worth, one way or the other. But the with liberty and justice for all, I have trouble looking at all of the unborn babies who have been slaughtered in the womb, and say that the flag stands for a republic that guarantees liberty and justice for all. It's a little much to swallow. Now, if you say, well, we're talking about the ideal. That's what I have to do when I, when I say the pledge, and I do say the pledge on occasion. But that, I have to put that up there. I'm talking about an ideal. I'm talking about what God wants for our country. Um, yeah, we, we fall into iconography. We fall into, uh, what, what, what's the equivalent word for things you say? In the Bible, if it were theological, you would say creeds and confessions and liturgy. Political uh, liter liturgy? Political liturgy, yeah. yeah. Civil yeah. religion. <laughs> yeah, the civil religion that acknowledges a God of some sort with these these magic words we're used to saying and we don't always think through them. I know in my I, I assume I did this when you were in my class. Have, have you heard James Clavell's The Children's Story? <laughs> yes. I yes. think I recorded it several okay. weeks ago. I think so. Yeah, it's... Uh. Yeah, where children... Well, it started when, when James Clavell's daughter came home and said, I can say it to my lady Oh, okay, go ahead. I'd like to leave this on the flag and she says the whole thing. And she, did I do it right? Yeah. Then where's my nickel? What? Teacher said if I said it right, we'd get a nickel. Okay, here's your nickel. Uh, but by the way, what, what does pledge mean? I don't know. What's allegiance mean? I don't know. Just growing up words we're supposed to say. And then he went on to write a book about what happens if you teach children the forms and not the content. The the political liturgy, the political iconography, there's a section on the flag too, but not the reality behind them. And so both with regard to the second and third commandment, we're talking about the danger of substituting fluff, mm -hmm. the words that sound important, sound pretentious, sound like they have great grand meaning, and yet we never really define them, let alone define them in terms of the God of the Bible. And you know, right now, if anyone's listening, we hope somebody's listening, probably there's some people getting upset because it sounds like we're attacking America. Well, only in the sense that we're attacking anything that raises its head against Jesus Christ, mm. which at some point is all of us. And we have to be willing to take our most treasured ideals and institutions and measure them against scripture and be willing to say, yeah, that's okay. I never thought about it. I never listened to the words. I never really considered what those words mean or what those pictures mean. And yeah, that is kind of not Christian, I guess. Anyway, fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day. Now, conservatives are fine with traditions. They're fine with things that, again, stabilize society. So a weekly day of worship is fine for other people. <laughs> if they are themselves Christian, then yeah, they go to church. If they're not, they may go to church, you know. Easter, Christmas, because it's 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 good. There's there's a line in uh, you both know Good Omens, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a line where uh, Adam's father, before Adam, while Adam's being delivered, uh, notices the the sisters about him and assumes that they must be Anglican or something. And he feels it gives him a good feeling to know that there are nuns in the world, sort of the way <laughs> one feels good to know that the Salvation is out there, Salvation Army's out there every Christmas drumming up funds. It just makes you feel like someone's holding the morality of the universe together. <laughs> and, and I think that the writers there were very perceptive. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of conservatives who are not themselves Christians, but who feel good that Christians are out there going to church every Sunday and and praying and doing religious stuff, because it's no doubt good for all of us somehow, but they don't really feel like going every Sunday, and they are a little nervous about dragging this Jesus person back into the American liturgy, American conversation. Honor your parents. Well, this the, the conservative vision's all over this one, because what is it except to honor the past, the vision, the tradition of the past, because they know more than we do. They've tried things out. They've proved things. So, yeah, we ought to, as Chesterton said, we ought to give the dead a vote. We ought to listen to tradition. 
uh, and more narrowly, children should obey their parents and you should honor age. But the, the reasons are all social. It's good for society. There's no talk here about divine analogy, the son obeying his father. Um, there's no talk about God's own commandments or God's vision or what God wants out of this. It is simply a happy conjunction of two different worldviews that happen to hit on sort of the same thing. Let's value the parent-child relationship and teach children that they generally ought to obey their parents. Okay. I think there tends to be an acknowledgement of this is how society functions, that if we yeah. lose this, we don't have much else. Because I think a lot of people who grew up with a stable set of parents that they had to obey are going to pass that on. You know, society needs stability. Knowledge and tradition must be transmitted into the future. That's a basic conveyor belt and more basic than the schools for the conservative vision. Well, that's good because the other side values the schools more because parents, for exactly the, the same reason, parents represent the past. We don't trust the past. We want new people with new ideas. We want these these brand fresh new teachers out of our teacher colleges to, to be teaching the young because they're going to have a different future focused on different values into the future. We don't want the dead hand of the past. But yes, a social need, not a, a religious one. Don't kill. Well, conservatives agree, and, and they understand the distinction between murder on the one hand, murder, assault, abortion, vigilantism on the one hand, and the peace officer, a soldier who is fighting to maintain civil order or to protect the innocent. They, they've, if they've got that down. But again, there's no eternal reference point. There's each, each life is protected because it's good for society. Not because God says so, not because the individual is the image of God. In, in, in the long run, then, rights are not inalienable because they're inherent in the individual. They're inalienable because that's best for society, which is to say they're not inalienable. Mm -hmm. Because the moment, it may be rare, but the moment society needs you to lay down your life for the good of the whole, it then becomes your moral duty to do so. Yeah, that's how we got the draft. Yeah, yeah. The, the scripture does not have a draft as such. And the the conservative take on that is to frame it as a self sacrifice, right? Mm. Which has yeah. a tremendous power because of you know the true, the true self sacrifice. The true self sacrifice. Yeah. Where can I can I yeah. say something that might make people mad at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're already mad at me, so go ahead. Cool, I can take some of it too. <laughs> Given the uh, conservative support for more or less endless wars in the Middle East, I don't think that their short-term vision of the Sixth Commandment is that good either. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Which certainly doesn't apply to all of them, but... No, and um, I, I think that the three of us would agree among ourselves that we support our troops. We want them to be safe. We want them... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Insofar as they have a job to do, we want them to faithfully and morally carry out that job to be the best army in the world. Having said that, that doesn't mean every war that we get them committed to is a war that needs to be fought. Mm -hmm. And we should not blame our soldiers necessarily. I mean, there are all these people who should stop and say, I will not obey these orders. They're immoral. But, you know, in general, soldiers should obey, they should obey orders. Just some orders should never have been given. And the American people who keep voting for the people who keep financing the wars or, or pushing the wars should, just as we as Christians tend to vote against abortion and candidates who push it, we should also start considering, yeah, eternal wars for eternal peace. No, there's nothing <laughs> biblical about that. Going out and yeah. killing people on the other side of the world because it might at some point help us out in the future or get revenge or something, it's not completely clear, especially when it's half-hearted. Mm -hmm. You know, this was, this was Vietnam. There was a real danger, but we weren't willing to commit ourselves to actually win. And so that's just, let's go shoot some people because it helps a little, but not much. And we'll never settle anything. That's not valuing human life. And that could be considered murder. But the, the ones who are murdering are the ones who have the policies and are forcing young men to go find an enemy they know very little about because they play on these young men's loyalty to their country and to the Constitution. Uh, it, it is interesting that our current president 
lost a lot of support from the military, traditionally a stronghold for conservative voting, because he started shutting down wars in the Middle East. He started mm -hmm. pulling their troops out. And there that means that for a lot of people in the upper echelons, there's no more life, there's no more promotion, there's no more power. Bad move to make if you want the military, the higher echelons on your side. Anyway, I'm sure we just offended tons of people there. So moving <laughs> cool. on. We'll, we'll read your emails. <laughs> we will. Send Someone will. Um, don't commit adultery. Uh, and again, conservatives, yeah, when, when people ought to stay married. They're having a hard time. Well, everyone has a hard time, you know, for the sake of, and it's amazing, for the sake of the children. You know, that, that's more than a statement of love. That's a statement about stability. Uh, we want the children to have a sane and peaceful upbringing so that they will have sound, sane lives and minds in the future. And so the pressure of society is, for that reason, you need to stay together or at least fake it. Hmm. Fidelity, honor, they're social anchors, but the conservative vision does not see them as spiritual graces. There's no call here for the work of the spirit to help me love my wife the way I'm supposed to. Um, I just should, you know, tough it up and be nice to the old hatchet or whatever, <laughs> uh, which is not, again, the Christian vision of marriage. Yeah. It's not like Christ and the church are sticking together for the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Don't steal. Well, the conservative vision places heavy emphasis on property rights and the duty of civil government to protect them. But as I said a little while ago, this is where Sol gets interesting. This is a quote from him. He says, the crucial benefits of property rights have been conceived as social, as permitting an economic process with greater efficiency, a social process with less strife, and a political process with more diffuse power and influence than that possible under centralized political control of the economy. You know, so what's not there is an absolute ethical standard, a commandment. It's, it, it works better economically, socially, and politically if we acknowledge this thing called private property. But ultimately, and, and he will go on to argue this elsewhere in the book, that when the welfare, the stability of the whole society depends that you give up this piece of property, you got to give it up, Buster. Because the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Efficiency, peace, and freedom are the ground of property rights rather than the law of God. Don't bear false witness. Now, again, the conservative vision agrees. Unless, of course, you're having to lie to a liberal congressman, federal bureaucrats, or the American public to get your project through. But generally, not lying is a good thing. <laughs> And it's, it's, there's been one or two times where I know for me personally, it's been tempting to say, well, yeah, they lied, but they were lying to bad guys. So, and for a good cause. And the bad guys probably would have stopped them from doing this good cause had they known. So it's kind of all right. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. But they're the good guys, as you said up front, Emily, but these were the good guys. How many no. how many well intentioned lies do you need before <laughs> you're no longer considered a good guy? Is it twelve? Is it twenty four? <laughs> yeah, maybe we should vote on the number and establish it someplace. Exactly, but we'll need a two thirds majority in yeah. both houses. <laughs> right. So honesty is a good policy most of the time, or as one of my friends once put it, honesty is a policy. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't covet. The law forbids lust, greed, and envy, and demands a radical heart change. It speaks directly to the hearts of men. But the conservative vision doesn't have any place for that. The assumption is this is the way men is, so this is what we have to work with. We can't ever expect men to be different. We can't ever expect men to do the right thing, to be truly selfless. Now, it doesn't mean they, they won't be a you know, we can, they can surprise us here and there, sure. But uh, the possibility of social change based upon wide-scale heart change, no. That, that, that's just not going to happen. But is um, that a difference in societal effect or in governmental administration? 
Uh, insofar as, as government is concerned with outward actions, it may not be that crucial in the outward operations of government. That's okay. That's what I was asking then. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, you still write the constitution with the assumption that people are wicked sinners. Not angels, at least. Yes, and are not angels, nor do you write the Constitution with the assumption that there will be a great awakening every other century. Uh, How about a pretty good awakening? <laughs> yeah. We have Minor an awakening. all right awakening. Yeah. <laughs> but when it starts getting to, to wanting to change things, and conservatives often do want to change things beyond just holding on, the most they can offer is external prompts functioning upon a selfish humanity. They really don't have anything else to offer. I mean, we can wave flat. We've talked about the, the, the images, the flag waving, the, the patriotic music. That's almost stepping into the other camp where we're, we're appealing to a feel-good thing rather than any kind of tradition. The, the, the real sell is the traditional Roman one. This is how a man dies. Go do it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the manliness is is holding the bridge against all comers and then chopping it down and diving into the water. Uh, it's it's laying down your life for the state. That's that's what you do. Well, we lost that a long time ago. You, you may remember that the uh, the early readers, for instance, McGuffey's readers uh, in America, were stuffed full of stories about Roman heroes, not Roman gods, but just the ordinary people uh, who, who held the Republic together because they, they, there was, they couldn't talk about Christianity. They couldn't talk about Christ. So they had to talk about, here are some virtues. Mm. Just gird up your loins and do them. Go be virtuous. Here, here are some examples. Memorize them. Commit them to heart. Be like these guys. Now go do it. And so we're left with that kind of gospel. There is no way of touching the heart. No conception of the heart can ever be touched. And so where in some places like politics, it may not immediately be obvious where the danger is. Just in daily life, it starts to become a real problem real fast. You talk to your conservative neighbor and he's having trouble with, say, his teenage daughter and, and drugs or his son and homosexuality. And... He says, well, I keep telling him to be good. I keep, you know, I, 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 I'm applying the discipline. I'm having a strong hand. You realize what they have here is a spiritual problem that needs to be met with spiritual means? You mean like I should pray or say something about God or something? Yeah, no, let's stop. May I talk to the police? <laughs> you're, you're left, as the McGuffey's readers did, you're left with a lot of be good here examples. Mm hmm and it's the assumption is that being good isn't all that hard, and yet isn't the philosophy that we're not all that good? There, there's there's a there's a contradiction within the system here, because what else do they have to give us except some flag waving and uh, stars and stripes forever? Mm -hmm. And so, in in more or less in conclusion, then we come to we look at the law, especially the tenth commandment, which shines it directly into our hearts. We see that God demands total heart submission, commitment, obedience, love, loyalty toward him as the starting point of, our, of all of our thinking. We don't add God in along the way. In every area of life, we begin from what he says because we begin by faith in his son. And without this, we are left with another gospel. We are left with some other way of creating social cohesion, whether it be the unconstrained vision or the constrained vision, whether it be man is good or man can be enticed and duped into seeming like he's good, <laughs> those, those are not the Christian gospel. There are things on both sides we can, we can learn. There are some observations they make that are correct insofar as they go, but neither of these systems reflects what is in Scripture because none of them are rooted in Scripture. Mm -hmm. They're odd hat constructions rooted in man's autonomy. And the law challenges us to not be content with there. Love the God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Uh, die daily. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. And that's something that neither side here is ever going to want to do until the Spirit of God changes their hearts. And even those actions are, are not something that we have a natural inclination or ability to do. 
it it is something gifted by the spirit it's not this thing latent in the human soul that right. looks out upon its circumstances and realizes the need for it and awakens <laughs> within itself to better society and all this it's the sovereign god reaching down through the spirit to change hearts of stone into hearts of flesh yeah, yeah. and we, we throw in the patriotic music in the background and forget what you're actually saying yeah <laughs> rather than throwing in some christian music like amazing grace or a psalm even the psalm yeah let's pick something from the psalter psalm 51 would be good so we have now looked at the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision using Thomas Sowell's book, which we still recommend yeah, as a convenient sure. lens. There's there's much he says that's interesting, that's profitable, that helps clarify these two political perspectives. But if you read carefully in the end, uh, we would hope that, especially in light of the things we've said, you understand these are not Christian perspectives. One is nicer and cleaner than the other. And works better. <laughs> and works better most mm -hmm. of the time. But that's not, God. God does not say, again, close enough is close enough. He wants our hearts, and he wants our hearts about everything, including the way we vote and organize our civil governments and our economic systems. So close is better than way far off, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And we we have the privilege of growing daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, decade by decade in sanctification, century by century for civilizations. And we have to push for that. We have to hope that our children will understand the Bible better than we do because we taught it to them, because we made it a priority. And because we were willing to make hard calls and say, hear that, son? Yeah, he's a great man. He got that completely wrong. That's not what Jesus says. Let's look in mm -hmm. the Bible yeah. and see. Awesome. Well, shall we wrap up with some recommendations? Um, my recommendation is a book by Richard M. Gamble called In Search of the City on a Hill, I believe it's called. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, In Search um, of a City on a Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a phenomenal analysis of one of the images that has wormed its way into American civil religion, um, the city on the hill. He argues that the source of it, the um, Winthrop speech aboard the Mayflower, I believe it was. Arabella. The Arabella, excuse he's me. He's not a pilgrim, he's a Puritan. Right. <laughs> Always get those mixed up. But he argues that in context... That line in the speech didn't really have the punch that it's sort of developed over the years of American rhetoric. Um, and he builds a very solid historical argument. I'm sure he wouldn't endorse everything we've said in this episode necessarily. I'm sure we don't endorse absolutely everything he says in the book, but um, he is a Christian. He's an elder in the OPC, a very godly man. Mm -hmm. And an excellent, excellent historian. Um, he was actually my academic advisor when I was in school. So I think he's pretty cool. Um, but the book is really excellently put together. Really five-star research. So I recommend that one. Nice. Um, I'll go next just because I figure Greg has one that's actually relevant to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> this week I just finished. I, I've recommended this series before. And it comes with caveats because the author is a Mormon, and it very clearly shines through in some of his books, in particular meta-narrative stuff in his extended universe. But the fourth book of the Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson was released last week. I think it released on Tuesday, and I finished it on Saturday. <laughs> it was very good. And... Um, <laughs> I can't really recommend this one without recommending the whole series, especially if you've not read the other three books <laughs> in the series. So just consider this a redo of Stormlight Archives. It's a good series. Can you give? I I don't remember what you said about it before. Can you give us some idea of the nature of the storyline? Ah, there's so much. It's a is very it complicated. Fantasy? It fantasy, is fantasy. Okay. Fantasy. There's a. Uh, Sanderson is known for doing really interesting magic systems. Uh, mm -hmm. So this one is. It's in the title of the series. It's a, a based on a energy source called Stormlight that uh, pe some people can breathe in and use to do cool things. And the the main, I think of him as the main character. There's technically like three or four main viewpoint characters, but the main one he can use them to basically lash himself with a connection point with this Stormlight and basically say, "I uh, I'm going to fall that way." And he uses it to fly. 
Um, oh, interesting. But the whole story basically revolves around a a coming existential threat that is called the last desolation. And the people of this world called Roshar have to unite in order to uh, protect themselves from what is essentially an interplanetary enemy and prevent the destruction of mankind and the uh, complete reforming of the face of the planet that they live on. And the problem with that is that the constrained vision is more correct about human nature and none of them want to. (laughs) So it's a really great series. Um, Highlights are really great character work and phenomenal battle scene descriptions where you are never left wondering, wait, how did they get over there? He he described, he, he manages to keep a very coherent description of what's going on in any battle scene. And uh, back on the character work stuff, just really great interpersonal work and dialogue and things are funny and people are flawed. And there's like, like he writes mental illness really, really, really well (laughs) in like this way. You don't feel like um, he read a Wikipedia article on schizophrenia and ran with it. He's like, (laughs) okay, people deal with this in this kind of way. And um, I'm just writing it in a fantasy world where people can fly. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) Cool, cool. Um, It's interesting that Brian should say I I was going to pick something that would uh, more closely reflect our topic. Because I didn't think it did until he said that. And I thought, oh, wait. (laughs) Um, Because I'm going to recommend Christmas caroling, specifically Mm. Christmas caroling in public buildings. Uh, I don't know if you two were around when the tradition, when we had the ongoing tradition, which died and then was revived. When the school was in Roseville, we would go down to City Hall mm-hmm. and we would take tons of kids and we would sing Christmas carols. And the office workers and the bureaucrats and such, the officials would come down and stand on the upper railings and, and come out from their doors. And they would eagerly listen to it as we sang the claims of Jesus Christ in the secular building, no one ever said, division of church and state, you must go away. They (laughs) applauded us. They they called for encores. They they were sad when we said, we cannot, we can't come, or we can't come at this time. Or when they said, you know, we have, there's another uh, extension of this department. It's it's over there. Could you go, Carol, to them that no one ever gets to them? We thought, oh, we don't have any way to transport people. We're sorry. Oh, and uh, apparently at a point before that group moved, they did catch us as we were leaving and going down the street and said, hey, all you guys come over here. They yelled from across the street. <laughs> come Carol to us. So these, these are our officials in our secular government who desperately want to hear us sing about it. Because we don't sing anything but the name of Jesus. We don't sing Santa Claus. We don't sing holiday tunes. We, we sing thoroughly gospel-centered songs and they love it. And it was, and it, sometimes they they even um, video us with their phones. And one year they uploaded it to their official website. <laughs> like, as long as we can keep doing this, we're going to keep doing this. COVID will probably be a problem this year. Mm. But if there's a way around that, it'd be great to keep doing that. So look for chances, despite restrictions. See if there are legal civil ways around them. Let me just step far enough apart. Face outward from one another, so you're not breathing on each other. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, go out and proclaim the name of Jesus, and do it where civil authorities can hear you. Maybe so. we also go to the post office, mm. and every year the post office, we always ask, and they always say, "Oh, sure." And usually the people at the counter are very thrilled too. I think we've had one or two. What's that all about? But usually, and I think the guy who runs the post office is Muslim, and yet mm. he wants us. He wants us to come in. It's part of that time of year and it's you know some people despise christmas because it's so secularized and yet it can be a cultural wedge for us to get the gospel in Mm -hmm. if we will be bold and take it just because everyone else is watering it down doesn't mean we have to so there's my recommendation go find go find a government bureaucrat and christmas carol to him with your little ones and he'll probably (laughs) love it (laughs) awesome well that is all the time we have for this evening uh, thank you guys so much for this conversation. I'm sure we've uh, 
set a number of small fires along the way, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to hear from people who have been angered by this episode. Um, if you have been angered by this episode, <laughs> Uh, please send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We would absolutely love to hear from you. If you want to visit our website, um, it's anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. We have transcripts and show notes. Um, if we've mentioned any books that you're interested in or movie lines or TV shows, I put links to everything in the show notes um, so you can check those out. Uh, next week, we're having a special episode because it is number 50. Um, we've invited a couple of extra guests who are very well qualified to speak on the topic of Christian education. And so we have a nice little discussion about discipleship and education and all these good things. Um, Kate joins us for that, Greg, your wife, and some of my one of my former professors and his wife as well. Um, so please look forward to that. Um, that'll be coming out next week. We hope to see you then. Take care.